and they read some statements from patriarchs and prophets, and they basically just move on and hopefully using spirit of prophecy as a framework, but just to talk frankly with you about what I see happening um, and where I think that we may or may not be going. So, you may or may not be aware, but in the life of David, he gets anointed four times. The four, four anointed in the life of David. And if you're familiar with the message that we teach, you know that we can construct lines in many different ways, in many different way lines. But the core timeline that we use is from 1989 to the Sunday law. And that's the reform line that we're going to be using today. And I'm going to look at David's four anointed to put them onto this framework that you and I are very familiar with. So from 1989, secondly 1911, and then midnight cry. You'll see that in the titles here we're using different titles based upon, uh, derived from different areas. So, 1989 is just a year, it's just a calendar year, but 911 is not a calendar year, it doesn't really mean anything. Although to most of the world everybody understands what this is. This is September the 11th, 2001, but we don't put 2001, we don't put September, we just put 911, because the whole world understands what happened at 911. The 9-11 was a turning point in Earth's history. Everybody in the world recognises it. But the vast majority of the world do not understand what that significant event was all about. And then we're picking up a term called the Midnight Cry. The Midnight Cry is derived from Matthew 25, the parable of the ten virgins. But it's also a phraseology that the Millerites latched onto because they recognised that they were fulfilling that parable in their own history. They had a, had a clear self-awareness that they were fulfilling that history. And as we review their history, we have the same awareness, the same self-awareness that we're fulfilling that history. And this is one of the things that causes us to be in opposition with the church. So our understanding of the fulfillment of the parable of the Ten Virgins of Matthew 25 and how we have a very specific and unique understanding of how that parable was fulfilled. So we pick up this phrase, from the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25 and the right history, and then obviously the Sunday law. The Sunday law, so that we're all clear on this, this is the Sunday law in the United States. And we have various Bible verses, various symbols that we use to identify this way mark. So we could use Daniel 11 verse 41, where the King of the North enters the glorious land. Or we could use the back end on the last part of verse 40, depending on how you see those two verses interacting with one another. But we would take this, this symbol, this word, mostly from the Great Controversy. Uh, Ella White talks about it frequently. He talks about it with a number of different symbols. But the quite amazing is that we get all of these different way marks from different sources. So we're in 1 Samuel, Chapter 16, verse 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, talking of David, in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. So this is the first anointing of David. And if you see the context of what's going on here in the church, the grand problem of what's going on here is that Saul, King Saul, very early on in his reign, has just been rejected by God. He's only been a king a very short period of time, and already he's been rejected by God. And as soon as that rejection happens, the Lord anoints David 
to be his man. And we're going to read some statements from Pedro Oxford to give some background of this. So this is the first anointing of David. This was 1 Samuel 16. Second Samuel chapter two, verse four. And the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. But it says there it's the city of Hebron, which is where Abraham buried his wife. This is where the king of Peter is. There it has many different names, but the name that's used in this uh, story is Hebron. The men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. And they told David, saying, that the men of Jabesh Gilead were they that very saw. So the point we want to pick up here, this is the second anointing, and it's been anointed by Judah. And this was by Samuel. Judge Samuel that um, anoints him, and then Judah anoints him the second time. If we go to 1 Chronicles chapter 11, 1 Chronicles chapter 11, verse 3. Then he came to his own house 
And when he required, they set him bread before him, and he did eat. Verse 21, and he said, then said the servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Is thou fast and weak for the child while he was alive, but when the child is dead, thou didst rise and eat bread? So we see a number of things happening. He has a change of power. He definitely says he anoints himself, and he says he rises up. I didn't go into the background of this story, I'm more familiar with this story. This is the fidelity that he commits with Bathsheba. And instead of punishing him with death, the Lord punishes him by killing his son. And that's the background of this story. Once he dies, he rises up and he finishes his intercession with God because he avails of nothing. And he anoints himself and changes his clothes. One of the things that we want to understand about anything that's connected with prophecy, and you may or may not have thought about this a lot, but the, the moral stories that are the backdrop of how we understand what those things mean prophetically do not connect one with another. Because if you see the story that's being portrayed here, this is the king that's in rebellion who's just committed the grossest of sins committed adultery, committed murder, his son has just died, and now everything sort of seems okay. And this is in the backdrop that I'm suggesting that the anointing of David is talking about the progressive work of organisation about the church triumphant. This is the church triumphant that we're discussing, and it's the progressive organisation of this church structure to where it's is perfected by the time you get here to the Sunday law, but you would not be able to identify that from the story. This is why we need to be really clear that when we understand and read these stories, both from the Old or New Testament, if we get stuck in the moral implications of what those stories mean, we'll never understand their prophetic significance. So that's one thing that um, I'm not addressing now, but we need to be clear on. So we're reading from Patriarchs and Prophets and uh, picking up from page 637. So I've just given this for references here that I'm going to pick up. These are all taken from Patriarchs and Prophets. The first one is 637.1. The Lord had chosen David and was preparing him in his solitary life with his flocks for the work he designed to commit to his trust in after years. So we're talking about his first anointing here. In his first anointing, it says that out of his obscure solitary life, the Lord had already chosen David. So when we talk about organisation of people of this message, because that's what this, that's what we're discussing here, that the Lord had already selected people way back here. They'd already been selected. If we drop down to paragraph two. <coughs> We read, and the Lord said unto Samuel, How long will thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have seen as I have rejected him for reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go, I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. So we can see what I said previously that here Saul has been rejected, and once Saul is rejected because of the leadership of this church, the rejection happens here. Not here. The rejection begins right here. That David has already begun to be anointed. The Lord has already got his eye on him and he's been set up to do the work that God has commissioned him to do. Going on to 638.1. Now she's talking a little bit about this same anointing. You know the story that Samuel goes and sees all the brothers of uh, Jesse, so all the sons of Jesse, but David isn't there. And he goes to the first son, who's Eliab, and this is what happened. He says, he wants to choose Eliab, but look what the Lord says. Eliab did not fear the Lord. He had been called to the throne. Had he been called to the throne, 
He would have been a proud exacting ruler. The Lord's word to Samuel was, look not on the countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. The man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. So right here, the Lord had already selected David, who is going to be part of this the leadership of this organisation that's happening right through this history is a representation of the selection of God's people during this time period and moving on to this time period. And I'll put it in place now. This is the period of the priests. Some of us may not be aware of why we use this, but this is just a symbol. When I use the word priest, it's a symbol. It doesn't mean anything beyond that. And this is a symbol which we identify as the Levite. These priests and Levites represent two groups of people that come from Adventism. Two groups or two classes of Adventists. And David represents this group of people, both the priests and at one level also the Levites. But we're going to just track the priests as we go through this time period here. So I'm identifying him as the priest. And everybody in this room, by the way, is a priest. Everybody in this room is a priest. You just have to work out for yourself whether you're a wise or a foolish priest. But all of us are the priests. All of us are priests because we're living in this time period from here. So the point we want to pick up from this first anointing is that the Lord had already selected you way back to fulfill the role that he wants you to do. Six forty one point two. Samuel had not made known his errand even to the family of Jesse, and the ceremony of anointing David had been performed in secret. Now if you go to 1 Samuel that we just read before, 1 Samuel 12, 17, uh, not 1 Samuel 12, 17, 16, 13. 1 Samuel 16, 13, I want to just remind you of this. He says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. In the Bible it says that David was anointed in the midst of his brethren. But Ella White comment on this says it's not so. She says, it's not there's a contradiction between the two, it's that the way that what the Bible is describing is not how it actually panned out in the detail that we need to understand. Because she says very clearly that first of all, Samuel, when he anointed uh, David, didn't tell the people, even his family members, what he was doing there. And the second thing we point out, that it was a secret anointing. He went separately and nobody knew what was going on. And David himself doesn't even know what's going on. So David is anointed right here, but he doesn't know what he's anointing for. So when you can, we start thinking about this movement that's progressed from, 9, from 1989 up to the Sunday level, we're going to go from the church militant to the church triumphant, and we're talking about organisation, what we need to be really clear on is that the Lord had already selected his people before, way back here, and they didn't even know it. They didn't even know it. The next one we want to read is 641.3. The great honour conferred upon David did not serve to elate him, notwithstanding the high position which he was to occupy in quietly continuing his employment, content to await the development of the Lord's plans in his own time and way, as humble and modest as before his anointing. The shepherd boy returned to the hills and watched and guarded his flocks as tenderly as ever. So after his anointing, right back here, he carries on working in the same way he used to. There's no change in his job function, in what he's doing in life. Um, I don't know. I'll just get there. So, uh, yeah. so, he knows he's been anointed. He doesn't know what he's been anointed to. And he carries on working as normal. Six ninety-seven point three. Six 
697.3. We now come to the section of 19. As the caravan entered the city, the men of Judah were waiting to welcome David as the future king of Israel. Arrangements were at once made for his coronation, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. But no effort was made to establish his authority by force over the other tribes. So here in this anointing here, it's only a partial anointing. The only people who recognise his authority and his role are the people of his own clan or his own tribe, the tribe of Judah. So it's only a partial authority or a partial fulfilment of the prophecy that Samuel has given about who and David is going to be. So we can see that by the time we get to 911, now what's being what's being brought to view is that the anointing that he had here is beginning to be fulfilled at 911. Now he comes on the on the stage of prophetic history and church involvement. Right here, when he becomes king of Judah, and he's anointed, we know that this is the point where Samuel dies. Not Samuel, Saul. So here Saul was rejected, and here Saul dies. So this is a really clear understanding, and we have many, many lines of truth to identify this, that the leadership being bypassed, when we talk about 9-11, actually occurs way back here. You can see this in a number of lives you see through the birth of Christ, that the leadership of bypassed at his birth, but the pronouncement of that is made. The pronouncement of that rejection um, is made at 9-11, or the baptism of Christ in 1827. So the thing we want to identify is that here there's a partial acceptance of who and what David is. 698.1 What I want to do as we just really race through the life of David is not only pick up this prophetic line, this, this narrative that we want to identify, but we want to identify some moral issues as well actually about what's going on. So, as David is being made king here, you see that there's going to be a struggle in the church. There's a struggle in the church about the acceptance or rejection of his role as the leader of Israel. But, there's many lines of truth in the life of David. And one of the things that I wanted us to pick up on, as I said, the purpose of this is not to do a prophetic study, it's to discuss organisation and how each and every one of us are dealing and grappling with this. So now I want to just shift our focus a little bit and think about ourselves. I want to think about ourselves of how each and every one of us are dealing with this issue organisation. You'll see the point that I'm making here. David's been anointed here. <clears throat> when he gets anointed, the Lord's going to select the people that he wants to be, the leaders of his movement, way back here and they didn't even realise it. It was only secret and nobody knew. Here, <clears throat> only a partial number of people are willing to step forward and accept him for who and what he is. 698.1 says, But David's reign was not to be free from trouble. With his coronation began the dark record of conspiracy and rebellion. David did not sit upon a traitor's throne. God had chosen him to be king of Israel. When? Way back here. He was chosen to be a leader way back here. But this is the point that he's identified as being that leader. But his reign is not going to be without resistance. He says this conspiracy and rebellion has occurred against David. David did not sit upon a traitor's throne. God had chosen him to be king of Israel, and there had been no occasion for distrust or opposition. Uh, 
And 698.3, two paragraphs on. We read, the circumstances under which Abner placed, under which Abner was placed, served to develop his real character and showed him to be ambitious and unprincipled. Let me explain the story here because I've cut a lot out. David's anointed king here of Judah. And the reason he doesn't get anointed over the whole of the house of Israel is because there's rebellion and conspiracy going on. The rebellion and conspiracy is, takes the shape that one of Saul's son, someone called his Boshev, is going to be nominated to be the king. And Abner, who was a general of Saul, he was a general of Saul, he's the instigator behind causing a division in the church. Sooner or later, Abner begins to realise that he's made a mistake. As time progresses from 9-11 to the midnight cry, Abner, and Abner is not someone who's out of this movement, Abner is someone who's in the movement, so that we understand really clearly. There's a conspiracy and rebellion going on in the movement, and Abner is one of these participants, and he realises he's chosen the wrong side. He's realised he's chosen the wrong side, and he wants to get on the right side now. So as time progresses, Abner realises that Ishbosheth was the wrong choice, because they're not good bedfellows. So he wants to come out of that relationship, and he wants to now side with David. That's what we're just reading here. The circumstances under which Abner was placed served to develop his real character, and showed him to be an ambitious and unprincipled person. So it's identified the reason why Abner, in this time period here, went against David, who was the anointing of the Lord, is because he had ambitions of self-service. Sooner or later he realises that he's made the wrong choices, now he's going to switch over. If you, take, if you take the opportunity, it's, it's chapter 69 to read the whole of the chapter. There's some very, very interesting points here. 699.2. Chapter 68. Chapter 68. Okay, chapter 68. I thought, for some reason, I thought it was chapter 69. But yeah, it's chapter 68. That's probably correct. <laughs> At last, treachery overthrew the throne that malice and ambition had established. So the reason why this contention in the movement is because there's malice and ambition. And he says, after becoming incensed against the weak and incompetent Ishbosheth, deserted to David the offer to bring over to him all the tribes of Israel. So this is his switch over. But you know the story that happens. He comes to David, and David accepts him or rejects him. David accepts him, his offer to bring the kingdom to him. But he's got a quarrel with the general of David. There's two generals, one of Ishbosheth and one of David. So this is David's cousin, I believe it is, Joab. Yeah? So Joab has got a blood feud with Abner, and he does what? He kills him in revenge. By the way, he says that just for killing, because. He did right. He's allowed to do that. It's legal killing. And you have to know it's a legal killing that's happened. And then in 700.1, this, this is just a straight Bible verse. He doesn't quote the Bible verse, so I'm just going to give it in the, in the, just that book. He says, It says, Die Abner as a fool dying. His hands were not bound, nor his feet were in fetters. As a man falling before wicked men, so fell us down. So how did a sorry, how did Abner die? He died as a fool. So who is Abner? Abner is a fool. He's a foolish virgin. So you know this is the transfer from this to this point here. And David is just about to be anointed king of Israel. And right at this moment, just before he gets anointed, you see the death here, 
of the foolish. The death of the foolish Abner, we can mark that at midnight. If you're familiar with the reform lines, if you're not, it doesn't matter. The point we're making is that first David is anointed here. There's conspiracy and rebellion against what he does. There's movements of foot to try and circumvent and prevent the Lord's anointing from taking his rightful role, even though he didn't even know what the role was. He gets asked to, to do this, and the Lord directs him to do this. We didn't read the passage here, because they first asked, because he's not in, even in, in Israel at the time, he's in the land of the Philistines, Ziklag, and he says, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? And the Lord directs him and tells him what to do. So the Lord is directing him what to do. And the Lord placed upon the heart of Judah to anoint him king. Then there's conspiracy and rebellion. The foolish virgins get on the wrong side. And then they realize at the end they're on the wrong side. So they want to switch over. And what happens? Just before he gets anointed king over Israel at the midnight cry, they get killed. They die. This is the same story as Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot has got conspiracy and rebellion in his heart all the way through his history. And at the end, he realizes he's made a mistake. He wants to switch back over to the other side. And he doesn't work. And he ends up killing himself, hanging himself and dying. So you just say these are parallel stories that are going on in this history. 700.3. Abner had been, listen to this is, you, you'll know that Abner is, is a foolish virgin by the identification of his character. We'll read this now. It says, Abner had been sincere in his offers and representations to David. So, you know, we spoke about wheat and tears earlier in Sabbath school. Was Abner sincere? He says he was sincere. He was sincerely switching over sides. But the problem is, it's now too late. He wants to switch over when it's too late because now, taking up the phraseology that everybody uses from Daniel 5, the writing's on the wall. He sees what's going to happen. He sees where this is heading. And it's not where he wanted it to be. So now he wants to switch sides. And he's switching sides is sincere, just like Judas Iscariot switching over and repentance was sincere. But he wasn't sincere, sincere repentance for the right motivation. He could see where this was heading. And we're going to read this now about Abner. It says, Abner had, was sincere in his offers and representations to David, yet his motives were base and selfish. He had persistently opposed the king of God's appointment in the expectation of securing honour to himself. It was resentment, wounded pride and passion that led him to forsake the cause he had so long served. So, right here, he's got resentment, wounded pride and passion that he's going to forsake the wrong course that he's on. So now he wants to switch sides. And in, desert, and in deserting to David, he hoped to receive the highest position of honour in his service. Had he succeeded in his purpose, his talents and ambitions, his great influence and want of godliness would have endangered the throne of David and the peace and the prosperity of the nation. So you may think Joab was good or bad, but Joab was serving the purpose of the Lord. And remember... The everlasting gospel is a three-step prophetic test. It's not a moral test. You cannot run into these histories and try to dissect the moral implications of what's going on about who is good and who is bad. Because everybody is fulfilling their prophetic role. Right here, Abner has to die because if he remains part of the movement, what will happen? He will endanger the throne. Really clearly. It says it really clearly that the foolish virgins have to be separated because if they remain, you'd get problems. And it's the separation of the wise and foolish virgins at this point here that creates what? It creates the church triumphant. The only difference between the church triumphant and the church militant 
which we really didn't press earlier on, is not that the good people get better. It's not that the good people get better. That's not the problem. It's never been the problem. What happens is the foolish virgins die. They come out of the movement. There's a separation. And that's what causes the church triumphant. Because the perfection of the good people doesn't happen here. It happens back here. It happens way back here. Because this is the first, this is the second, and this is the third step in the everlasting gospel. And this is where perfection happens. Not here. In fact, if you want to get technically correct, perfection actually begins right here. If you want to be technical about it, it begins right here. When you acknowledge that you're a sinner and you come to God and confess and repent, it's at that moment. Seven oh one point two. After the death of Ishbosheth, there was a general desire among the leading men of Israel that David should become king of all the tribes. And then came all the tribes of Israel to David unto Hebron and spake, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. So what does it mean if there is bone and their flesh? It means they're united totally. And what's the, what's the classic definition that we talk about when two people become one flesh? This is the marriage. This is the marriage. And you see over and over again the symbology at the midnight cry. You see this symbol of one flesh. It's been identified right in this story where all of Israel recognize and realize that now they are one flesh together. So here, you identify the number 12. Because all the 12 tribes have come together and the 12 tribes are now one flesh. You get, this, you get this same line of truth in many, many different stories, but you see it in this one. And the next one is... 7.1.3. Uh, yeah, so we just read 7.1.3. Oh no, we haven't read the second one point three yet. The change in the sentiments of the people was marked and decisive. So that's the change of the people. Oh no, sorry, we read seven oh one point two, that's what we just read. And now we're reading seven oh one point three. That's what God is saying. So we just read that all of the twelve tribes have now come together, they've joined and they're now one flesh. The one flesh is a symbol of the marriage. This is the symbol of the marriage in the church, but it's also the symbol of the image of the beast at midnight cry two. That's what's been marked in this story here. And then it says, 701.3, the change in the sentiment of the people was marked and decisive. So here, there's a marked change that's going on. And what causes the marked change? It's the removal of the foolish virgins. We spoke about this early in Sabbath school. So once the foolish virgins are removed and separated, a change happens. And, and what you realise by that is that the contention that's happening, if you think about the story of the twelve disciples in the time period of Christ, the reason why their characters are not being demonstrated and developed in the way that they should be is because the foolish virgin, through the scary in there, is causing problems that people aren't even aware of. He does it so subtly that they don't even realise that he's the cause of all their problems. Their own spiritual advancement is being hindered without them even realising it. Just his presence does that. Uh, and there's the last section. It says, The scepter was placed in his hands. The covenant of his righteous sovereignty was written, and the people gave their pledges of loyalty. The diadem was placed upon his brow, and the coronation ceremony was over. And if you're familiar with the study of Esther, where do we mark 
the scepter and the diadem. Same place. Big eye pride right here. He gives you just another witness of that. And seven twenty two point two. Last eight on this. We're going to switch gears. Seven twenty two point two. Prophets and uh, patriots and prophets still say Lord. And this is now talking about this anointing here. Though there would be found none in Israel to execute the sentence of death upon the anointed of the Lord, David trembled, lest guilty and unforgiven, he should be cut down by the swift judgment of God. But the message was sent him by the prophet, The Lord also has put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. So, two things are happening here. His sin's been put away, and he's not going to die. So two markers, we already identified the change of clothes, we also identified his rising, his anointing, and now it's identifying that he will not die, marking who? 144,000, because of what? Because his sin has been put away, he's been blotted out. There's no sin in him, God cannot find any sin in him, because he's all been put out of the, he'll be buried out of the way, he's been blotted out. So, this is a potty history of the progressive nature of organisation. You may or may not be aware, but this movement has been around for a long time. We could mark 1989 if we were minded to. But officially, we would normally mark the year 1996, where this message was formalized. Most people here are familiar with reform life, so you know why 1996 is a, is a prophetic way mark that we would recognize as being where we talk about this message really taking shape or coming into itself. When this message first began, and everybody in this room, from 1996 up to 2016, have obviously come onto this message at various stages along the room. <coughs> Most people here, including myself, including the people that were in this movement way back in this time period, none of them had any realization that we would end up where we are today. Nobody realised that. Just like when David is being anointed, he has no idea what he's being anointed to do and what's going to happen and what his life is going to be all about. So nobody had the awareness of this. So this organisation has caught many people by surprise. If you're like me, you got into this movement because somebody brought to your attention that there were some really good Bible studies going on somewhere by somebody. You looked at those Bible studies and it did something for you, and you thought, this is the word of the Lord, this is true, this is, this makes sense. Um, and not only does it make sense, this is a really nice way to understand the Bible, because everything seems to be clear. That's what my attraction was about this message when I first came on, a long while ago. And as I say, I had no idea that it was going to turn into anything like this. So when we talk about this organisation, the first thing I want us to realise is that no being busy, <coughs> What's happening was never going to happen. In fact, just like the Millerites, everybody's message was adamant that this is just a, a message, a warning to the church, and we had no thoughts, no plans, no ideas that there would ever be these fellowship groups going on, that we would have some kind of level of internal organization, that we'd structure ourselves in a way in preparation for something. Nobody had any thoughts and ideas of all of these things. But, within the last 12 months, Elder Jeff Bippinger has been, been, has been impressed by the movement of the Holy Spirit, if you want to believe that, that organisation is now necessary. And he's had to be wrenched out of his comfort zone because this is something that he actually publicly stated would never happen. 
that we wouldn't be organised, we wouldn't form fellowships, that we should all remain in our local churches as best as we're able to, and uh, press forward this movement, this message, in a different dynamic, in a different way than, than, it's, than it's actually happening now. So it's taken everybody by surprise, including himself. But when you begin to see these lines of truth, these prophetic lines of truth, it's become clearer and clearer that organisation is not only necessary, but it's the Lord's will that it has to happen. And this organisation is happening progressively. In its most basic sense, it's happening in a two-step process. It's the first the organisation of the priest, and then the organisation of the Levite. There's this two-step process that's gone on. So I'll give you a bit of background because people, many people have asked this question about how we got to where we are today out of the blue and people didn't even realise what's going on. So you may or may not real, be aware that I was invited to go to the School of the Prophets in Arkansas to um, lead out in some teaching work that's being done there. Um, there are various, there's various reasons why uh, they're asked, they, they asked me to do that, but they've asked many people to go um, to at least attend their school so that people would come face to face with us with one another and they could begin to develop bonds and friendships and relationships that you do with meet people face to face. So they've asked many people to come, many people in responsible positions across the world. So that's, that was one of the reasons, that, that was the main reason why I was asked to go, to um, develop networks and connections with people there, but also to lead out in their, um, in their morning class, the class that you and I all watch, um, hopefully we all watch, that, that's, that's put out every morning at their school. So anyway, as part of our discussions during my time there, we were talking about the development of the organisation of this movement and how it would proceed and how it would move on. There are a number of things that we are aware of, both myself, uh, Future for America, and yourself. And it's these three things. Baptism, Communion and organising or groups. <coughs> it's been recognised that these are these are three areas that need that have been needed to be addressed for a long time now, over the last twelve months. And during my time there, it finally got resolved how that should go ahead and how we should, what it should look like. So it was agreed, it was decided that the way to proceed would be for the fellowship in Arkansas, which is not the ministry, but it's their church. It's called Lambert Fellowship. You've probably all heard of it. You should have all heard of it. Uh, if you're not new to this message, um, they regularly have their sermons uploaded onto YouTube. They're all available on our website, themidnightcry.co.uk. And it was agreed that there would be uh, the beginning of organisation. The way that would happen would be that selected individuals would be ordained to the gospel ministry by the laying on of hands and the anointing of them. I hope that all of you are aware of all of them, that, that that ordination has gone, that has, ha has, has, has happened, and hopefully you've all watched that present, that, that service and the sermon that went along with it. And people are wondering why that was done secretly or without pre-announcement, or 
something along those lines, depending on what your individual question was. And I guess to me, it's a matter of opinion of how you view that. I don't view it that way at all. In fact, when you look back in the book of Acts, if we had time, we could read it, and I might kind of just find that passage. You'll see, in the book of Acts, when Paul and Barnabas are in Antioch, they do the same thing. It's the local church who take it upon themselves to anoint people in their midst to go out and do a work for them. They didn't seek permission from other places. So once that work had been done, both in time of Antioch, in time of Paul, and it's just been done now, people are asking, what are we being ordained to do? Or being ordained as. So let me see if I can find a passage to deal with this. Take it from Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16. In fact, what I'm going to do, is, well, I'm just going to quickly read this. Uh, it won't take long, it, it, will, it, will, it will clarify a lot of things. Chapter 16. We want to write the, oh, with reference to the short, right? Let me, let me rub some of this off here, because I don't need any of this stuff anymore. So I'm going to read from Acts of the Apostles, beginning at page 155. And what I've done is I've just collected the snippets and I'm going to run all the way from 155 right back to 164.2. And I'm not, going to, I'm not going to show you where the great are, I'm just going to read this. After the disciples had been driven from Jerusalem by persecution, the gospel message spread rapidly, and many small companies of believers were formed in important centers. just want to stop there, because I want to make another important point. One of the discussions that's ongoing, and I think we'll talk about it this afternoon, is how we're going to be organized in the UK. And I want to start off by saying, I think there's a big misunderstanding about how organisation should work, what it should look like, and how we go about moving forward about this. I just raised here, it says, after the disciples had been driven from Jerusalem, the gospel message spread rapidly, and many small companies of believers were formed in important centres. So sort of read another passage, this is 17, 21.4. 7 Testament is 21.4. Okay, so I'm going to read this, it says, the formation of small companies as a basis of Christian efforts has been presented to me by one who cannot err. If there is a large number in the church, let the members be formed into smaller companies. So we have a biblical mandate that whatever we do about organisation, it should be done in small companies. We should not have a centralisation of power. It should be done in small companies. Part of this system or this idea of organisation on a worldwide level that's, that has just started by the organisation of three people in three continents is to not have a centralisation of power. Uh, the Ministry of Future for America, that's headed up by uh, Elder Jeff Bippinger, do not want to have some kind of centralisation of power. The power should be, not, I was going to say distributed, but it shouldn't even be distributed. It should go down to individual groups, individual fellowships, individual people making their own decisions led by the Holy Spirit speaking to them individually. And you have to tie up that with the idea of having some kind of organizational structure. And that's what the difficulty has been. It's always been that problem, and it always will be. So that we know. But the first premise we want to understand is that it should be done in small groups. There shouldn't be this concentration of power anywhere. The gospel was taught in Antioch by certain disciples from Cyprus and Cyrene, and their early statements were productive of fruit. Tidings of these things came into the ears of the church, which is Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. So 
So Barnabas is sent from Jerusalem to Antioch because there's something going on there. The labor of Barnabas in Antioch were richly blessed. As the work developed, Barnabas felt the need for suitable help in order to advance the opening problems of God. And he went to Tarsus to speak for Paul. Barnabas was successful in finding, in finding Paul and in persuading him to return with him as a companion in ministry. So how, now we have Paul and Barnabas in Antioch and they're working together. This, this presentation I'm doing now is a follow-up from the presentation that I did at the ordination service. The reason why you need to know that and have watched that previously is because you need to understand the dynamic that in Millerite history, if I put 9-11 here, and we talk about the Tarian time, the Tarian time in Millerite history is identified at the beginning, and the Tarian time in our history is identified at this point here. It happens at later on. It's the back end of this history, because it's the front end of this history. I'm not going to explain anything further than that, but if you don't have clarity on why that makes a big difference, you need to go back and watch that uh, that uh, sermon because I explain exactly why that is important to understand. And if you don't do that, some of this stuff does not make sense. In Antioch, Paul found an excellent field of labour. He proved just the help that Barnabas needed. For a year, the two disciples laboured unitedly in faithful ministry, bringing to many a saving knowledge of Jesus. The call of God in the earth today is in need of living representatives of Bible truth. The ordained ministers alone are not equal to the task of warning the great cities. God is calling not only ministers, but also other consecrated laymen. So you know that when God, when Elohim talks about ministers and laymen, he's talking about two groups of people that everybody's supposed to be working. So when we talk about organisation in this movement, we should be thinking about ministers and consecrated lay people. Lay people are people who are in secular labour, and that's how they earn their money. But they're meant to be consecrated doing the work. There are two groups of people. God, is abundantly blessed. God had abundantly blessed the labours of Paul and Barnabas during the year they remained with their believers in Antioch. But neither of them had as yet been formally ordained to the gospel ministry. This is why you need to understand when we identify the tarrying time, it's at the beginning and at the end. Because here they are, they're labouring at this point here for a year. And it's based upon their successful ministry prior to their ordination is the reason that they get ordained. So ordination is not some kind of trial period that you have trainee elders or trainee ministers. That was not how the gospel ministry was set up in the New Testament church. It was done on the premise that people had to prove themselves before they were ordained to the ministry. And that's what we're going to see here. That's why we've not been able to have organisation any earlier than we've had now. The organisation has to happen at the end because whoever they're going to be ordained to the gospel ministry has to have proven themselves whether or not they're capable of doing that role or taking that position up. But neither of them had yet been formally ordained to the gospel ministry. They had now reached a point in their Christian experience when God was about to entrust them with a carrying forward of a difficult missionary enterprise. So we're heading to a difficult missionary enterprise. I'm on page 160.1 at the moment. But I'm, 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 I'm I've cut and pasted, I've just cut out a lot of information. I'm on page 160. I'll, I'll take the paragraph that I'm on as I go through it. I'm on 160 at the moment. In the prosecution of which they would need every advantage that could be obtained through the agency of the church. So, for the gospel ministry to succeed successfully for these men, to continue their work in a way that would be productive, they needed the acknowledgement of the church. That translates today that if people are going to be leading out in some kind of venture, some kind of organisation, the church, at some shape or level, which is this movement, needs to have approved or recognised that fact, that the people are not self-appointed. So the point we want to pick up is that people, the leaders of this church, those who do gospel ministry, are not self-appointed people. The church has to do that appointment for them. We're in 160.2 now. There were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work run to I have called them. So the Holy Spirit is driving this movement 
to call the separation of Barnabas and Paul to the gospel ministry. So you have to figure out for yourself whether or not the Holy Spirit has spoken and said to Future for America, Lambert Church Fellowship, only Jeff people do individually, whether or not he's instructed them to go ahead and do what they've done, to call out individuals and ordain to the gospel ministry. Before being sent forth as missionaries to the heathen world, these apostles are solemnly dedicated to God by fasting and prayer and the laying of hands. Thus they were authorized by the church. The church is authorized them to do these three things. To teach the truth, perform baptisms, and to organize churches. She says those three things here, but community talks about it in another place. So, oh, she talks about, let me read this again. Thus they were authorized by the church not only to teach the truth, but to perform the rite of baptism, to organize churches, and they were invested with full ecclesiastical authority. So full ecclesiastical authority includes giving communion. That's 160.2. And the church has invested these two men in this story with that. And the church that did it was the church at Antioch. It was not the church of Jerusalem. They didn't even ask their permission. They just went ahead and did that because the Holy Spirit was in this movement leading them. 161.1. The Christian church was at this time entering upon an important era. We're just about to enter into an important era, an era, sorry, from the midnight cry onwards. There are many, many studies that indicate what that work is going to be. The work of proclaiming the gospel message was now to be prosecuted with vigour. So, not in agreement with what we spoke about this morning, when we talked about the church militant and the church triumphant. We spoke about the church militant as being some kind of militant way of doing things, or with vigour, or with force. But now we actually realise if the church triumphant is here at the midnight cry, that's when things are actually done in a militant way, with uh, a vigour. The work of proclaiming the gospel message was now to be prosecuted with vigour. The apostles who had, just, who had been anointed to lead out in this work would be exposed to suspicion, prejudice, and jealousy. This is on this movement. This is by the church, in the context of, the, of this history here, the Acts of the Apostles, you've got the Jews, which are ancient Israel, and now you've got the New Testament church. And the New Testament church, in our context, are the people of this movement. And the people who are suspicious, jealous, and have prejudice are people who are Christians in this setting, which equates the people in this movement. And the reason for this is because in this time period, we're still in the time period of the church militant, and there are tears amongst us. So this is the reason why they're going to be anointed. Their teachings would naturally subject them to the charge of heresy and their authority as ministers of the gospel would be questioned by many zealous believing Jews. Those Jews are the Christian Jews. God foresaw the difficulties that his servants would be called to meet, and in order that their work should be above challenge, he instructed the church by revelation to set them apart publicly to the work of the ministry. The ordination was a public recognition of their divine appointment. So the reason why men have been publicly ordained the gospel ministry is to deal with this issue of any kind of challenge or question of their right to do or to, to do whatever they need to do. I, I don't know how clearly I can say that. Um, I just read that again. Their teachers would naturally be subjected to the charge of heresy and their authority as ministers of the gospel would be questioned by many zealous believing Jews. Their ordination was a public recognition of the divine appointment. It's so that there wouldn't be a challenge of authority. 161.2 both Paul and Barnabas had already received their commission from God himself. They'd already received the commission. So it wasn't about their walk with God. It wasn't about their understanding of what they were supposed to do or what they were 
we're not supposed to do. The point being, they already knew what they were doing and they were already doing it. The ceremony of the laying on of hands added no new grace or virtual qualifications. So I just want to make this one point here. Now I've been asked a number of times, I've heard rumours, and the rumours only occur in the UK, not anywhere else I've been. Oh, what am I? Am I an elder or am I a pastor? So I want to, I want to bottle this out really simply. The ceremony of the laying on of hands and no new grace or qualification. So I am neither a pastor and neither an elder. So I am ordained in the gospel ministry. So however you understand that to be, you understand it to be whatever you understand it to be. But I'm not a pastor and neither am I an elder. I was not ordained as a pastor. I was not ordained as an elder. I was ordained as this one person who is a minister of the gospel. And a minister of the gospel has this authority. They are authorised by the church. This movement has authorised me to perform baptisms, to organise groups, and to be invested with full ecclesiastical authority, which means to be able to administer communion. Now, if you want to put a label on that, you're free to do so. If you want to call me brother, or elder, or any other epitome, I don't have a problem with that. But I want that to be clear that there is no new qualification. It was an acknowledged form of designation to an appointed office. So the appointed office is the appointed office of a gospel minister. And a recognition of one's authority in that office. By it, the seal of the church was set upon the work of God. So this is why, for me and for others, the ordination service, not just on a personal level, because that's what I'm trying to address, but on the level of this movement is an important way mark because now the movement has set its seal that we are beginning to have a self-awareness that we are to be organised and that is something that's new to the Jews this form was a significant one and when the ministers of the church of believers in Antioch laid their hands upon Paul and Barnabas they by that action Ask God to bestow his blessing upon the chosen apostles in their devotion to the specific work to which they had been appointed. Later on it talks about how this right of ordination and labor of hands has been greatly abused. And it says unwarranted, unwarrantable importance was attached to the act as if a power came upon one Sorry, as if power came at once upon those who received such ordination, which immediately qualified them for any and all ministerial work. But in the setting apart of the two apostles, there is no record indicating that any virtue was imparted by the mere act of laying on of hands. There is only the simple record of their ordination. Thanks. There is only one simple record of the ordination and the bearing that it had on their future work. So I want to make this clear. The ordination service, the laying on of hands, does not change me into somebody else. It doesn't endow me with some new powers that I didn't have a couple of weeks ago. It's a recognition by the church of something that should already be plain. Should already be plain. Now, I'm not saying it should be plain for you. At the Church of Antioch in Arkansas, it was plain to that church what the Lord had called them to do. But it doesn't mean I come back to the UK and I'm the pastor of the UK. It does not mean that, that I'm some kind of boss or leader over you folks. What it means is that the Lord has begun the work of organisation at a worldwide level. You may not understand how that organisation is working. 
you may not accept how that organization is working. You may not like the people that the Lord has selected for that organization. But we're all stuck with it. If we're in part of this movement. Hence the story of David and Abner. Hence the story of Paul and Barnabas. All of this starts at one premise. That you have to believe on a personal individual level that this movement is being led by God. And that this is the final movement of this church, the legacy in church, then they made this church. The judgment of the living has already begun. It's well underway. And we're reaching the time period when the foolish virgins in this movement, <coughs> I'm going to say, are beginning to separate, but that separation process is well underway. It's been going on for many, many months already, but it hasn't finished. There are still foolish virgins amongst us, and they seem to die. And we know that because we're beginning to be organized. We don't have the opportunity to read from Acts of the Apostles. Uh, I'll give you the chapter number. It begins from page 12. Chapter 2. Begins from page 17. But if we were to read that, we would see that by the time you come to the midnight cry, the organization of the movement is already well established. It's, it has to have already well established. Because what's going to happen here in the midnight cry, you're going to get a rapid influx of people. And then there's going to be a second, a second wave of anointing and ordination that goes on. This is the ordination of the seven deacons that goes on here. So first it was the twelve, but now it's the seven. And the reason why that second organization has to happen, that second wave of organization has to happen, is because the church numbers are increasing rapidly. But Ellen White's really clear in her analysis of that story, of that history, that if there wasn't already well-established organization, nothing would have happened. So the apostles in this time period here had already established proper lines of organization. But as the numbers grew, that organization needed to be modified and changed. So if you can see that the organization which has called everybody, right from the people at the top of this movement, to the people who are new in this movement, by surprise, it's because this is new light. And this new light is happening just at the point where it's going to be fulfilled. So we're just heading at the midnight cry when this organization is happening. So what I've tried to do so far is to clarify how this organization has happened, why it happened, how long it's been going on for in discussion what the initial fruits of this organization is. The three men have been ordained by the gospel, to the gospel ministry in three separate continents. Other men, no doubt, will be ordained to that work too. There's a large work to do and the laborers are few. How those men will be identified and nominated, the Holy Spirit, I'm sure, will reveal to us in due course, that there are, that there's an undercurrent, and I don't say this in lightning, and I'm not saying this about any issue that I have personally with anybody, but it's a stated fact. It's a stated fact prophetically, and it's really happening in our movement, that there is contention, there is dissatisfaction and there are murmuring and rumourings, rumours and murmuring going on about what is happening, how it's happening and why it's happening. So you need to be clear on that, that these rumours are out there, but you need to be clear for yourselves individually whether or not you believe what's going on is a fulfilment of prophetic history or not. 
And if you do, you need to understand which side of the, the argument you want to be on. Because when Abner came to his decision, he switched over sides but it's too late because he died as a fool. Now, I'm not, this is not some kind of vitriolic rally march to say you need to rally around me because I'm going to sort everything out and you need to all pay me homage or whatever. This is not how I see it and I hope this afternoon we'll be able to talk about it. You ask a question however you want to, whatever questions or concerns you have. But I want to make it clear that the ordination and the appointment of three men, including myself, the gospel ministry is a separate issue to whatever you may or may not think about organising some kind of UK ministry. They're not the same issue, they're two separate issues. Do they have some interaction with one another? They certainly do. And this afternoon I'll give you some ideas. I'll give you some information on what my ideas are about how we may or may not move forward in the UK. But that aside, what I want us to be clear on, whether you like it, because we're really, really over time. This movement, without me realising it, and it's probably called you by surprise as, it, as many of us, because I never had any intention when I went to the Glorious Land recently to come back as a, in the role that I find myself in. I, there, was no, there were no plans for that happening. It uh, happened as the Holy Spirit spoke to people. It's the clearest way I can express that. You have to recognise or deal with that issue personally between yourselves. But as you're doing that, and you talk, not only today, but in the coming days, weeks and months, and those conversations are already happening, I know they are, that there are people in this movement who are not happy about the way things are going. You just need to be honest and straightforward about that. And I'm being frank with you about that right now, because that's the state is back. I've heard of rumours. But even if I hadn't, I could read through prophecy and I could tell you that was going to happen. So you know it's happening, straight out of inspiration. So as you talk to one another, be cognizant of the fact of what the Lord is doing and what people around you are doing. I don't want to say much more at the moment because I want to give you an opportunity later on at lunchtime when it's before enough time to, to, to think about what I've said. As I said, I've been as straightforward as I can. I've been honest about how I see things, about the state of things in this movement, particularly in the UK because I'm interested in the UK because I live here, um, about my role in the UK about my role internationally and about your role in your position where you see yourself where you think things should be heading what you want to see so think about that over lunch and have some questions afterwards in our question and answer session hopefully that should be a productive a productive time so I'm going to close this slide we're just going to close the prayer and have a day. So let's pray. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your loving kindness and your goodness towards us. Lord, even now as we discuss things in a way that we think we know what we're talking about, yet Father, each of us has to be honest and realise that we don't even know what tomorrow holds. Father, we look back into history and we see so many events, so many stories happening. And it's our work to piece those things together, to have a clearer understanding of what's going on in our own lives, in our own movement, in our own church, in this world. Father, one thing is clear. Whether 
the men that you appointed to lead out this movement many, many years ago, whether they have made a mistake or not, whether they are listening to your voice or not, men that be the name of the gospel ministry. Father, help each of us to be clear in our own hearts and in our own minds whether or not such a mistake has been made, whether or not we're headed in the correct or the incorrect direction. Based upon our personal understanding of these questions, we will know what to do and how to behave ourselves. Father, we know that there are weak and tears in this movement. But it's our prayer, Lord, even though that struggle must happen and we cannot avoid it, that no we would be prematurely harmed or hurt by that struggle. Father, my prayer is this morning that you would be with us, that you would bless us, and that our conversation over lunch and the rest of these Sabbath hours would be nothing that would be that would bring glory and honour to you, Father. Help us to understand very clearly the things that are happening in our world, in our church, in our movement, and in our hearts. The question was asked, do we know whether or not we're weak or whether we're tears? But each of us be very clear about that question, Father, in the way we conduct ourselves for the rest of these sacred hours. We ask and pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.